The book we call the Bible, that's made up of 66 books between the Old and New Testaments, written by some 40 different authors over a period of 1,600 years, supernaturally culminating into one doctrinal system, moral standard, and plan for salvation, documents that long before the world began, God had a plan to bring salvation through Jesus to all those who would choose to believe and follow Him. God knew we would need a savior. He knew we would need to be set free from death. Throughout the scriptures, woven through verse after verse in the Old Testament, are prophecies that speak of Christ who was to come. Bible scholars have concluded that hundreds of years before Jesus was even born, more than 300 prophecies were recorded telling of his coming and how he would defeat death that we deserved for our sin, setting us free. One of those many prophecies was from the prophet Isaiah, who hundreds of years before Jesus' birth would say to us, for us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. From the beginning to end, the Old Testament reveals God's heart for restoring us to a relationship with us, delivering us from our enemies, and leading us toward the fullness of His promise, which would ultimately be fulfilled through the arrival of the coming Savior, Jesus. Now, as much as the Old Testament speaks of this coming Savior, its final chapter still closes without satisfaction for our sins. Because as the New Testament book of Hebrews 10 verse 4 tells us, the religious practice of sacrifices made by man in the Old Testament was insufficient to take away our sins. You see, that's the work of religion where God was seeking to restore relationship. And so there was an expectation At the end of the Old Testament writings, an expectation of this coming Messiah who could save us once and for all, as documented in the last book of the Old Testament from Malachi 3 verse 1, where it says, the Lord who rules over all says, I will send my messenger. He will prepare my way for me. Then suddenly the Lord you are looking for will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant will come. He is the one you long for. The people are longing for the promise of this salvation because the religious sacrifices they engaged in were not sufficient. And now from the close of the Old Testament, no further scripture would be written until the next greatest moment in history occurred. The coming of the Messiah spoken of in Malachi, whose blood would take away the sin of the world, unlike the insufficient blood of bulls and goats religiously sacrificed in the Old Testament. And so the beginning of the narrative of the New Testament would only start about 400 years later with four gospel accounts from men like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The word gospel meaning good news. Like, hey guys, you know that longing that you've had for so long to experience salvation that goes beyond your insufficiency using goats and bulls to make religious sacrifices? You know that longing for salvation? Well, good news, gospel. The one who is able to save you from your insufficiency is here. How many times have you perhaps waited personally in anticipation for God's salvation in a situation where you are suffering? 
It's like we're waiting on God to do something. Man, the breakthrough's coming. The healing's coming. I'm trusting God. Maybe it's in the area of health or provision, peace or breakthrough. How many times have you asked God to give you a sign of the supernatural in your struggles while you waited in anticipation for his salvation? Now imagine the anticipation of God's people from that final promise in the Old Testament of Jesus' arrival until its manifestation in Christ's birth as recorded in the New Testament. Imagine the anticipation. Over this long period in history, I wonder what kind of sign the people expected considering the size of the promise and the lengthy wait after hundreds of years of prophecies. I wonder what kind of sign the people expected. I don't know if you've ever, like me, said, Lord, give me a sign. Well, we know that there was one group of super spiritual, highly educated men in the scriptures called Pharisees. And they believed that based on the Old Testament prophecies about Jesus and how he would come to rule, that he must be someone who would be born in a royal palace with a heroic bearing and commanding presence, who would grow into a great warrior like David and lead his people to drive the Romans out of Israel, rescuing them from their oppressors. They were waiting for that kind of sign. But as we read the New Testament account, it tells us in Luke's gospel, chapter 2, verse 12, that the sign of the Savior would be a baby wrapped in clothes Cloths lying in a manger. You see, God's sign of salvation seemed suspiciously secular rather than sacred. A baby wrapped in cloths lying in an animal's feeding trough. Give me a sign, Lord. Unlike the Pharisees' expectation of the sign, Jesus wasn't called the Messiah at his birth. Neither was he born into a royal palace. Instead, he was born in a manger and grew up in a poor carpenter's home. His external appearance was not majestic or extraordinary, but ordinary and normal. He didn't lead the Israelites to overthrow the rule of the Romans, but walked among the common people, preaching the way of turning from sin and teaching them to practice forgiveness and to love others as themselves. God's sign of salvation seemed suspiciously secular rather than sacred. But that's not because the sacred presence of God was absent in the secular. It's because the sacred was so close to the secular that it wasn't easy to distinguish between the two. If this was the mighty God that had been prophesied about, he seemed to be too secular and not sacred enough, too natural to do the supernatural, and too human to be heavenly. We fail to see the sacred amongst the secular, not because the sacred presence of God is absent, but because it may be closer than your sense, closer to your sense of the secular than you would expect. It's so close, the sacred presence of God, to our weakness, our mess, and our mistakes, that it seems mundane instead of miraculous. You see, in one of Isaiah's prophecies about Jesus' birth from the Old Testament, he says in Isaiah chapter 7, 14, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. He wasn't called the Messiah while he lay in that animal feeding trough, but he was God with us. You see, the Messiah is in your mess because God is with us. During Jesus' life on earth, So many missed the power of the Messiah's presence because they didn't expect him to be found so close to their mess. Not only did Isaiah prophesy of Jesus' coming, 
as Emmanuel, God with us. He described how the world would respond to Jesus when he wrote of Christ in Isaiah 53 verse 3, saying that Jesus was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and he, we held him in low esteem. We hold God in low esteem when we assume just because our lives aren't revealing obvious signs of the sacred that there's the absence of the one who was supposed to be our savior. Here's some of the comments made about Jesus by those who thought this way as documented in scripture. John chapter 1, 46 records the response of a man called Nathaniel who heard that this apparent savior prophesied in the Old Testament was from Nazareth. And he said, Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And then in Matthew's gospel, chapter 13, verse 55, it records the local people responding after Jesus had been teaching. And they said this, isn't this the carpenter's son? (laughs) Ooh, big spiritual guy now teaching us about great things. Isn't his mother's name Mary and on his brothers James and Joseph, Machomi and Simon and Judas? In other words, the people assumed that because Jesus was so human, he wasn't God in their midst, but a mere mortal man. How often do we look for a sign from God in our situations only to find ourselves asking, perhaps like Nathaniel, what good could come out of this? Or or like those locals, God, where are you? Because I don't see any obvious miracles in this very mundane situation. The answer to those questions may be you did not recognize his sacred presence because he was so close to you in your situation that you failed to see his sacred work. The sign you wanted may have been too close to your humanity for you to recognize it because you didn't expect to find the Messiah in your mess. So let's look a little closer at that last verse that I shared with you. Now listen to the context as as these locals hold Jesus in low esteem from Matthew's gospel chapter 13. They say, isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. It's possible to feel offended with God because of our sense of his absence or failure to come through for us in the supernatural ways with the signs we expected. I don't know who's sitting here saying, well, I've given up on that God thing. I'm a little offended Because in the middle of my suffering, I saw no sign of a savior. It continues, but Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own town and in his own home. We can overlook the miracle maker because things seem mundane. God's not working because I don't see any obvious sign of his supernatural hand in this situation. So, The scripture then explains the result of this, this attitude and this incorrect perception of the sacred person of Jesus. And it says in verse 58, Jesus did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. The miracle that you are looking for may be in the mundane rhythms of your everyday life because Jesus is sovereign in all situations. Don't miss out on the miraculous work of God in your life because it's packaged in the mundane moments of your human experience. No one thought the miracle of man's salvation prophesied in the Old Testament would be packaged in the mundane moment when a baby was born, wrapped in cloths, and placed in a manger. 
You see, the power of God's promises can't be determined by the packaging. This is why we can draw from the spiritual principle in the Old Testament book of Zechariah chapter 4 verse 10, which says, do not despise small beginnings. Yahweh well, God, look at this. What are you going to do with this? Yahweh well, God, you know how much I've lost. I had no sign from you, supposed to be my savior. Where are you? I'm offended by you. And it's not because he's not true to fulfilling his promise. It's because we've missed him based on the packaging. Don't despise the small beginning out of the suffering you've had to face in this last year. Don't ever think for a moment that just because you're so surrounded by what seems secular, the presence of your Savior is absent in your situation. If you've asked God for salvation in your situation, your faith is about believing He's working in His sovereignty even when it doesn't make sense. Even when instead of hearing the triumphant entry of a victorious savior that overthrows the Romans, you instead experience the vulnerable cry of a baby wrapped in cloths. Here's the good news. What we saw as the small mundane beginnings of the Messiah's apparent entry into our human mess is no way reflected or no way reflects whether or not he can fulfill his promises. Even when we wrote him off as a mere mortal, it wouldn't keep him from fulfilling the miraculous as our Lord and Savior. And the same principle applies to you today if you've missed his sacred work in a struggle you've been experiencing. Even if you don't see it, our God is still faithful to work the supernatural in his sovereignty. You see, although we may not identify with the Pharisees and their expectation of the sign of the Savior, Jesus, his own followers also had an incorrect perception of the powerful work of his salvation. And that means you and I may find ourselves there too. Just... Because you seek to be close to Jesus doesn't mean you don't struggle in the ways of his working. Yet this won't stop him from, from fulfilling his promises. Jesus' own disciples thought Jesus would hail from David's line, the tribe of Judah, and be a conquering king instead of actually being crucified in the process of defeating death. In fact, there's a moment in John's gospel, chapter 12, where Jesus is actually trying to explain this process to his followers through a parable in which he says, very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, referring to himself, unless a kernel of wheat, what, a little piece of wheat, what are you going to do with that? And what are you going to do when it's dead? Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies... It remains only a single seed, but if it dies, it produces many seeds. They're like, no, that small thing, dying, that's not great. That's not victory. This isn't a sign of a savior. Where is God in this and what do you mean? In fact, they were so confused by the idea that this, this would be a sign of the process of God's salvation that we read in verses um, 34, how the crowd responded. It tells us, the crowd spoke up. We have heard from the law that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? They're like, no, how can you say that, that like a seed, he must fall to the ground and be lifted up again? No, no, we understand the sign to be the Messiah that will remain forever. So how can you say, Jesus, is their response. How can you say, how can you, God, say that you love me when you didn't protect me from that abuser as a sign of your power? God, how can you say that you care when you took my spouse instead of healing him as a sign that you are with me in my struggle? God, how can you say I'm worthy when I messed up so badly and you didn't keep me from the consequences as a sign? Our struggle with the packaging and the work of God's promises started with the birth of a baby. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? 
And this time as Jesus speaks, the sign the people struggled with was not about the Savior who would arrive, but how he would rise to victory from death as they had believed and understood prophetic words had been described from the Old Testament. A seed falling to the ground didn't seem to be the kind of sign they would expect from a victorious Savior. In the same way that Jesus' birth in men's eyes didn't seem to signal the arrival of the highly anticipated Messiah. You see, at Jesus' entry into our mess, all we saw was a common man, not a Messiah. And in Jesus' final moments in human flesh, all we saw was the death of a victim instead of deliverance by a victor. But while we saw a human baby born in a manger, God saw his son born into humanity's sinful mess. And when we saw a man buried in death on a cross, God saw a seed planted to birth new life for all mankind. God's sovereign power was so great that it was working in situations that seemed to lack the presence of sacred power. Think about it, the small beginning of a baby's birth and the seemingly sad ending of a man's life on a cross were the very moments in which God was fulfilling the powerful promise of man's salvation. How many times have we missed the signs of God's presence because we could not understand the unimaginable sovereignty of our Father in every struggle? You see, in His birth, Jesus was God bringing His home into our humanity. And in His death, Jesus was not a victim buried, but a seed planted to produce a harvest in fulfilling God's promise. No matter what you've gone through or what you are facing, there is Emmanuel, God with us, born into the middle of our mess, sovereign in every circumstance and able to bring blessing out of your brokenness and birth life out of places of death. And all that we need to do, all we need to do, all we need to do is make room for the Messiah in our mess.